Welcome to the uh, first session after the keynotes. So, uh, in this room we have a uh, massive view controller, who are you and what have you done to my architecture by Marlon Sundberg. Marlon is working as an iOS developer at the Australian Broadcast Corporation in Sydney. She moved from Sweden to Perth, Australia, in, uh, Australia, in 2013 uh, to complete a Bachelor of, of Science in computer, uh, uh, in computer Science. And in her final year, she started to work as an iOS dev at a startup company in Perth. Additionally, in the lecture theatre right now, we have a session on rapid app development using web technology with Adam Rice. So, Marlon. All right. Thank you. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Marlon, and I'm working as an iOS developer at the ABC. And today, my talk is called Massive View Controller. Who are you, and what have you done to my architectures? Um, so today, I'm going to talk to you about iOS architectures. Um, so for that, I'm going to start out talking about uh, a typical MVC use case. Um, after that, I'm going to go over to talk introducing some alternative architectures. Um, when I'm done with that, I'm going to discuss, um, we're going to look at some different criteria that we should consider when we choose an architecture. And after that, I will finish up by going back to an earlier example and choose an architecture that fits this specific example. Um, so, we have all been there. Uh, we have this brilliant idea, and we want to make an app for it. In my case, at the ABC, we wanted to make a news app. It's called the ABC app. Uh, for this app, we want to display a lot of different articles for the user to be able to read. Uh, so we need to have some data in our, uh, in our app. So we need a model to represent this. So we're going to add that to our app. So this is our basic model in the ABC app. Um, it's just an article structure which contains a title, a subtitle, uh, the publish date of the article, a URL to the article, and an image URL for the article. And then we have our basic initializer and our initializer from a JSON dictionary. So that's pretty straightforward. Um, what we need now is a way for the user to actually be able to see and read the articles. So we need to, be, we need to add a view component to our app. So this is our view component. This is our table view that we will be able to display for the user. And it contains a few cells. These cells have a couple of labels in them and an image as well. So that's also pretty straightforward. Um, so now we have our model, we have our view, but we need a way to actually control what models we display where in our view. So we need a table view controller. Uh, I don't expect you guys to read this, by the way. It's just for exemplifying. Um, so what this does is that it has a, this is a table view controller, which contains all of our models. So it contains an array of articles. Uh, and then it contains our basic UI uh, delegate and data source methods. So it contains our view did load method. It contains number of sections in table view. And then self or row at index pass. So it's pretty straightforward. And at this point, uh, we might think, look at this. We have a pretty great separation between our model, our view, and our controller. And we might even think, MVC is the best. So let's move on and see what else we need in our app for it to function. As I mentioned, this is our table view controller. This is the current state. And we do have some articles in this uh, table view controller. But we don't actually contain this these articles in our, in our app itself. Um, we actually want to retrieve these articles from uh, our backend server. So we need to actually add some um, network calls to be able to retrieve this data. Uh, so we're going to add that to our table view controller. There we go. And when we're on it, um, we need to provide a user with a way to refresh the articles because we constantly keep on creating new articles. We want the user to be able to stay on top of the news. So we want to be able to add a, we want to add a pull to refresh functionality. Um, so we will need that functionality in our table view controller as well. There we go. So now we have our data in our controller. But this data is not necessarily how we want to display it in this specific view. So for example, we have a date when the, when the article was published, but we don't just want to display a date in our app. We actually want to display a timestamp for this. So for example, if the article was published two days ago, we want to display a timestamp that says two days ago. 
And if it was an hour ago, we want to display the timestamp one hour ago. Um, so for this, we will need to add some um, presentation logic to our app before we actually, um, before we actually display this timestamp. So we're going to add that to our table view controller as well. One thing I haven't told you guys about is that um, a user can actually tap one of the cells in the table view, and that will lead them to a detail view so they can continue reading more about that article. So we need to have some type of routing mechanism for the user to be able to actually, um, for us to actually be able to create a new view and create the dependencies for the view and then to route to that view. And of course, we can set up a segue in a storyboard, but that's only going to give us the flow. It's not actually going to give us the dependencies. So we need to actually have some dependency injection in our table view controller. So we need to add that functionality as well. And since it was dev world, I needed to add an uh, envelope drop as well. So there we go. And if we look at this, it's just a mess now. This is not really what we wanted to have in the start. Like we wanted to have a really clear separation, but we have ended up adding a lot of complicated uh, functionality into our table view controller. So what we have noticed is that once we actually don't just present some static data, our app becomes a lot more convoluted and this class is just a mess. So what do we do about this? Uh, at this stage, maybe we should start looking at other options. Maybe MVC is not the, pa is not the pattern that we should use. And we should actually start looking at some alternative approaches. Um, what we did was that we, we did some research and we were looking at already established architectures uh, to actually get some inspiration. So if you, if, you do, if you research this topic, you will find that there's a lot of established patterns already available. And I picked a 25 minute talk, so I'm not gonna go through all of them, but I'm gonna introduce a few of them. So the first one is MVP. So MVP is Model View Presenter. So this builds upon the MVC pa pattern and it adds a new component called the presenter. Uh, another popular architecture is MVVM. Uh, MVVM also builds upon the MVC architecture, but it adds one more component called the view model. Uh, and in MVVM, we have the model, we have the view, and in MVVM, the view actually incorporates both the view and the controller. So those are two components go that goes into the one, um, one view component and then we add an extra view model. And this view model is responsible for all of our presentation related logic. Uh, another very popular architecture is Viper. So this is a view interactor presenter uh, entity routing. This is quite a complex architecture and it actually separates our app's uh, responsibility into five different components. And on top of that, we also have some helper, helper classes. And this is great for a large code base and if you have a lot of developers commit into the same code base. Um, you can keep on reading about those architectures and you might think that some of them provide some great functionality that we really can use in our ABC example. Um, but then as you keep on reading, you might feel like it just doesn't feel right. So either, um, either we might start out with a very simple architecture uh, that has a few different components and then uh, once it comes to adding functionality, we realize that it just doesn't fit into these components and we end up with a messy, um, messy code base like in our MVC example. On the other hand, we might have something like, we might choose a very complicated architecture which has great separation at the start, but then once it comes to actually adding more functionality to our app, it's very difficult to actually maintain this structure. Now we have looked at some different, uh, different architectures that are already established. And with this in mind, we should look at some other criteria. So we should look at how to choose an architecture. So something we should consider is how complex is our app going to be? And I know this is really difficult in the beginning of a project, but it's very important for us to actually consider the scope of the app and consider the uh, future progression of the app because then we're actually able to um, keep that in mind when we choose our architecture. Um, the next thing we want to consider is, can we reuse some of the code? So in our ABC app, we have a lot of functionality that's, that we see uh, in different views. So we want to be able to actually reuse some of the code um, across, the, across multiple screens. So that's important to consider. 
Um, the next thing we want to consider is if we will have feature progression. So is this going to be a MVP application that we just want to get out as quickly as possible, or is it going to be a flagship app that we're going to keep on building upon for years? Uh, this is something that's important when we choose our architecture. And what else we want to look at is uh, who will work on our app? Is it just the developers we have in our team today that will touch on this code base? Or are we hoping to get more people on involved in our project? And if so, what, uh, what experience do those uh, developers have with the different architectures? And how, if, how difficult will it be to onboard them? So with that in mind, let's look at our um, ABC app and the criteria for this app. So if we look at our functional requirements, we have seen that we have a lot of network calls. Um, so we need to be able to handle that. And we need our architecture to be flexible so that we can uh, reuse some of our network calls. The next thing is that we need to be able to apply some presentation logic uh, to our data before we actually display it. And as we've seen, we have a lot of, we, ha we have some routing logic in our view as well. So we want to keep that in mind that we need, to, we need to handle our different routing. And when we look at the functional side, um, this is our flagship app. We hope to get a lot of users. Um, so we care about testability. Because every time we introduce a new fe feature, we want to be able to keep on testing our previous implementations so to make sure that we haven't introduced any new bugs. And when we have testability, we will also contribute to single responsibility. And this is important for us because we want to be able to reuse certain components and uh, contain the functionality um, so, that we, so that we actually can reuse each of our functions. And as I said, we care about reusability. And the last thing we uh, also want to consider is uh, feature progression. Because it's our flagship app, we want to be able to keep on adding to that code base. And of course, ease of onboarding developers. We really hope to grow our team, so we want to be able to uh, get more people on board, and we want to be able to actually get them involved in the code base on early on and uh, get an understanding of how our code base works. So we have looked at our different considerations and uh, our criteria for our application. So let's look at how we choose a pattern that fits those criteria. As I mentioned, we do have a lot of presentation logic, and we also have UI-related logic. So we thought that something like MVVM provides us with a great foundation. Um, because MVVM will allow us to keep the model that I showed you earlier, and we can also keep the view as I, that I demonstrated. The thing that we will add is our view model. Uh, and this view model will be responsible for containing our presentation logic. And that will help us to actually get some data away, uh, get some functionality out of our table view controller. So it will help us clean up our table view controller. All right, so we're going to add this view model uh, component. Uh, and this is going to be a simple struct. And just for, for being able to show you how the code is moving around, I'm going to move up our table view controller. This is the state of our table view controller. And we want our view model to manipulate our models before we pass them on to our table view controller. Uh, so we need our view models to be able to access our models. So we're going to move our article array over to our view model. Uh, so right now, our view model contains the article array and some other few variables that we need for our presentation logic. And as I said, the view model is responsible for our presentation logic. So let's move over our presentation logic from our table view controller to our view model. There we go. So now the view model contains our functionality of how to, uh, how to create a timestamp for an article state. Uh, so that's already cleaned up the table view controller a lot. But what we still have in our table view controller is our network requests. And we don't want them there because, first of all, it's not really the table view controller's responsibility to handle our network calls. And also, we want to be able to reuse those network calls in other parts of our app. So we would like to remove them away from our table view controller. And in, MV, uh, in MVVM, we don't really have a, um, there's no defined uh, place for us to put our network requests. So what we decided to do at the ABC was to add a helper, a helper class. So this helper class is responsible for doing our direct API calls and handle, uh, handle the return values. So all we need to do is to actually interact with those helper classes from our table view controller. 
So that means we can take a lot of code out of here. And this all looks good when I move code around, but I just want to have a closer look and actually show you what this does. So we have separated the business logic into our view model and our controller contains our presentation logic. Um, so if we look at this function, which is in the controller, this is our self for row at index path function. And what this does is that it assigns all of the labels in the cells uh, to have a specific value. So for example, the title labor gets the, um, gets the title of a specific article and so on. But what we want to look closer at is this specific line. So what this does is that it assigns the timestamp labels text to the, to the value that the view model's timestamp to display for article function returns. And this is really nice because we can actually only contain, we can keep our uh, view layout related logic in a table view controller while our view model takes care of generating the timestamp. Um, so what this one does is that it actually looks at an, uh, an article at an index and it looks at that article's published date. Um, it then compares this published date to today's day and then depending on how long ago it was published, uh, we're generating a string. Um, for example, if the article was published two days ago, we will return the string two days ago. If it was published an hour ago, we're going to return the string one hour ago. Uh, so this is great because we actually have all of this logic in our view model, so we can actually directly test our business logic independent from UIKit. So um, we have moved. We have we had a we had a look closer look at how our uh, code is separated between our controller and our view model. Now we should look at the current state of our table view controller. And this is the table view controller, and it's still quite large, and it still contains our routing logic, which we don't want there in the first place. Um, so what we ended up doing here was to look at something else than MVVM um, because we really want to separa separate out our routing logic. We started looking at other alternative patterns and we found coordinators. You don't have to understand that, you don't have to know that much about coordinators, uh, but the basics of them is that a coordinator um, is uh, initializing our table view controllers and the dependencies for a table view controller, and then it's responsible of routing to this table view controller. Uh, so it takes on all of the responsibility, uh, all of the routing responsibility that we had in our table view controller before. So let's have a look at that coordinator. So this is our home feed, co home feed coordinator. Uh, it contains a navigation controller, uh, and then it just contains a basic initializer. And this is the function that we're interested in. This function is called initialize home feed. And what this does is that it does our initial data retrieval. So it's going to interact with our network helper to retrieve data. Um, and then depending on the result of this network call, um, if it's successful, that means that we're going to add, uh, we're going to use this data that we just retrieved um, to create our home feed view model. Because our home feed view model is the component that contains our data now. So we want to be able to pass in articles on initialization of our home feed view model. Um, so if our, uh, if our network call is successful, we get the result and we pass that in to our home feed view model when we initialize the home feed view model. Once we have initialized the view model, we can use this to initialize our table view controller. Um, so we do create a table view controller and we pass in a parameter, which is our home feed view model. Once we have created our home feed table view controller, we will route to this view controller. And that's how we set up our first table view controller. Does that make sense? Does that feel clear? Cool. We also have to handle our error case here. So if we do get an error back and we're not actually able to initialize our home feed view model, we need to display an error message to the user. So we're going to display an alert message um, which basically just informs the user what happened. And that's something that's going to be called from our error case. And this is all looking great for our initial initi initialization of the table view controller. But uh, how can this help us to thin in our view controller? I mentioned to you earlier that we have a pull to refresh functionality where the user can actually pull to refresh the view. 
And this is, of course, a network request that can fail as well. Uh, so that means that we will have to display an alert to the user at that state as, stage as well. So it would be great if we could just reuse the functionality that we uh, previously declared in our coordinator in our table view controller if we get an error case. And that's exactly what we're going to do. We are going to add this value to our table view controller. This is a variable which is called display error alert. And this value is going to be initialized um, when we create our home feed table view controller. So in our coordinator, um, when we initialize our home feed table view controller, we pass in a parameter which is called display error alert. And this parameter um, is what's going to be called for, it's, it's what's going to be, be passed to this value. OK, so that looks pretty good. How else can we use this? As I mentioned, we also have some functionality, some routing functionality if the user taps a cell. So if the user taps a cell, we want to be able to route to a new view. And it would be great if we could actually have this routing functionality removed from our table view controller and added to our coordinator. So that's exactly what we're going to do. This is our current um, create article view for navigation. This is currently uh, located in our table view controller. So what this does is that it, it looks at a, when, when I use the tabs SL, this is going to be called, and it's going to create a new uh, view controller for the new view. So what we're going to do is that we're going to add a route to article table view controller, uh, sorry, a route to article value in our table view controller. And this is going to be initialized in the same way as our display article alert is being initialized. Um, so now, in our home feed coordinator, um, when we initialize our home feed table view controller, we're going to pass in the behavior of how to route to a new article. Um, so now, the function that used to be contained in our table view controller is going to be contained in our coordinator. So the coordinator handles both the displaying of an alert and the routing to the new view. Um, so that's great. So we can act this means that we have actually been able to clear out a lot of code in our, coordinate, uh, in our table view controller. Um, and the table view controller is actually just containing the basic functionality that we intended it to uh, contain. So it has all of our delegate and our data source methods. Um, but all of the presentation logic has been moved to our view model and all of the coordination logic has been moved to our coordinator. So let's look at some of the benefits that this coordinator provided us with. The, the coordinator has helped us to um, provide our initial resources. So we're able to actually initialize the, uh, we're able to do the network request and retrieve our initial resources that we need for our view. Then it helps us to actually initialize our view. And then it also provides us with some coordination and routing between this view and between our uh, next view as well. So what we have ended up using here is a pattern that we call MVVMC. This is a hybrid between a model view view model and the coordinator pattern. And we think this works great because it does fulfill the requirements that I mentioned earlier. It provides us with testability because we have separated out our business logic so we can easily test that. And it also provides us with single responsibility uh, because we have actually been able to separate out the re business responsibility and the coordination responsibility out of our table view controller. And this also provides us with reusability because we have this separation. And it also helps us with feature progression because we do have everything separated out into our different components, we know where we should go to add more code if we want to add more features. And it also provides ease of onboarding new developers because um, we have a clear separation between our business logic and our presentation logic and our routing logic. So it will be very easy for a new user to come on board and actually look where we actually follow how we have laid out our code. And we also get a really cool name, MVVMC. So some takeaways from this is um, I think it's important to be aware of the different architectures um, that are already established. Because once we know those architectures, we know their pros and cons. And we can use that when making a decision about what architecture we want to use for our app. And the next thing is to know your architecture requirements. 
So it's important to know if, we, if we're going to keep on building upon our app. And also, it's important to know if we want to reuse some of the components across uh, multiple views of our app. The next thing is to uh, think through the app's future scope. And I know this is really difficult, but it's very important for you to actually think about if, if you want to uh, continue to maintain this app in the future. And that really helps you when uh, making a decision about what architecture you should use. And the next thing is to be pragmatic. This is something really important because what we ended up using here in the ABC was a hybrid between MVVM and the coordinators. So this means that um, because we have been pragmatic, we can find an architecture that fits our specific use case. So this is very important. Thank you very much. That's it. Thank <laughs> you.